Welcome to Reaching Your Peak, an educational storytelling mini-series of the Elk Talk podcast. This is Corey Jacobson, and today I'm going to be sharing a story from one of my previous do-it-yourself public land elk hunts, and then breaking down a strategy or a tactic that was instrumental in the success of that hunt. Reaching Your Peak is brought to you by Peak Refuel. If you're looking for delicious freeze-dried meals that are made with 100% real ingredients, including premium USDA meats, you've probably already heard of Peak Refuel. Their meals have nearly twice as much protein as the competition, which is important for fueling your body in the backcountry. There's no fillers, no empty calories, just premium nutrition that truly meets the needs of elk hunters. And the taste is second to none. My personal favorites are their homestyle chicken and rice and the beef stroganoff, but they have a huge selection of other incredible meals like chicken alfredo, biscuits and gravy, chicken coconut curry, sweet pork and rice, mountain berry granola, and a whole lot more. If you want to taste the difference, visit peakrefuel.com and use the promo code ELKTALK to save 15% and get free shipping on your next order. Welcome to another episode of Reaching Your Peak. I have a good story for today's episode. It's a story that includes an even better lesson learned, which uh, is a tactic that I've drawn upon several times since I first stumbled into it. If you're liking these story-based podcasts, be sure and let us know and share them with your elk hunting partners and friends. To email us, just go to elktalkpodcast.com click the contact tab at the top of the page and fill out the form, which is going to send us your comments or questions. Before I jump into this episode, if any of you are going to be attending the Total Archery Challenge in Big Sky, Montana this coming weekend, be sure and track Randy and I down and say hi. We'd love to meet you and shake hands. I'll be around the archery event most of the day on Friday, and I'll be at the World Elk Calling Championships that are presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation most of the day on Saturday. And now let's jump into another elk hunting story. You've likely heard me talk about my good friend David Burdett in the past. Burdett is from West Virginia and now lives in Tennessee, but he's been coming out west elk hunting since I was in high school. And he and I have spent countless days chasing elk together. He's one of the most consistently successful elk hunters that I know of from back east. And he's also one of the biggest characters you could ever hope to meet. Burdett has a very heavy southern drawl. And much of what he says sounds like he's trying to talk with a mouthful of marbles, which makes it hard to understand most of the time. And given his backwoods upbringing and his colorful personality, it's probably a good thing most people have a hard time understanding him. There was a little boy who lived next to us several years ago, and when he met Burdett for the first time during one of Burdett's visits, he said, I feel like I'm experiencing a whole new language for the first time. Most years, Burdett would drive straight through from Tennessee to Idaho to come out elk hunting, and he'd usually roll into my house late in the afternoon looking like a sleep-deprived zombie, After that 30 or 35 hour drive, he'd usually crash that evening and sleep in the next morning and then get up and do some last minute shopping while I was at work. And then we'd head up to hunting camp that next evening. And this was the case in early September of 2004. We made it to camp and we got everything set up around 730 or so in the evening on Wednesday, which was the 8th of September. We only had 30 minutes or so left until dark, so we rushed out to a close-by drainage that we'd hunted in the past to see if we could hear any bugles. We didn't hear any, but on the drive back to camp that night, we stopped at a handful of other potential areas to bugle in the dark, and we did get a response from a bull, which gave us a good idea of where we could start our hunt the next morning. That next morning, we parked at the base of the mountain where we'd heard the bull the night before and started climbing up the steep hillside right at daylight. 
everything was really quiet that morning. But when we reached the first vantage point where the hillside met the main ridge, we got a response. It was most likely the same bull that we'd heard the night before, but it was now quite a ways up higher on the mountain. We ended up chasing that bull clear to the top of the mountain and lost track of him when he dropped off the backside to bed down for the morning. Burdett was dragging after two straight days of sitting in a truck and coming from basically sea level to 7,000 feet or so in elevation and then tackling a pretty steep mountain on that first morning. I could tell he wasn't ready for an all-day death march. So rather than dropping off the backside and continuing to chase the bull like we might have done, we decided to head back down the mountain to the truck and take a nap and then come back hunting that evening. So rather than dropping off the backside and continuing to chase the bull like we normally would, we decided to head back down the mountain to the truck and take a nap and then come back hunting that evening. It was probably around 11 o'clock or so when we made it back down to the road that we'd parked the truck on. And as we're hiking along the road, I let out a location bugle and kind of pointed the bugle across the canyon at a really good looking, north facing, really heavily timbered drainage that was across the canyon from us. A minute or two later, that location bugle was answered by kind of just a half-hearted response about three quarters of the way up the hillside on the other side of the canyon. We paused there for a little bit to see if we could tell if the bull was still moving or if he'd bedded down for the day. So I continued to call and the bull only responded maybe once every 10 or 15 minutes, but it was enough to tell that he was definitely staying in the exact same place. And because of the really weak response, we figured he was bedded down and probably not really looking for any activity. I looked over at Burdett and he was looking kind of the same, weak and not ready for any activity. So I just suggested we could go back to the truck and drive back to camp and take a nap. And then we could come find that bowl later that evening. Plus right then the midday thermals were moving up the hill, which was gonna make it really tough to just cross the canyon and then go straight up the hill after the bowl right then anyway. After a good afternoon nap, which really just consisted of me listening to Burdett snore for about three hours, we were ready to head back out. And Burdett had managed to shake off the glaze that had been covering his eyes for the past couple of days, and he looked a lot more rested and ready to go. There was an old logging road that we found that took us about halfway up the mountain that the bull had been bugling on that morning. So we drove it and got to a point where it crossed a ridge that was down below where we figured the bull had been bugling from. And we parked there and then started hiking up the ridge from that point. Once we had hiked up to a level that we figured the bull was at, we dropped our packs and just hunkered down under a tree to sit there for a while and listen. It was probably 4.30 or so in the afternoon, and it was still pretty hot out. We figured the bull probably wasn't in any hurry to get up and start moving around that afternoon. So we just sat there quietly, waiting for the bull to bugle on his own so we could pinpoint him and get an idea of exactly where he was before we moved in any closer. After an hour or so, the sun started dropping behind the ridge and the hillside that we were on started getting shady and cooling off and we were completely bored out of our minds from sitting there for so long. So I just decided to throw out a soft location bugle just to see if we could get the bull to reply and let us know where he was or at least make sure he was still there. And I got no response. So we waited probably 15 or 20 minutes uh, after that and then I threw out another location bugle and again no response. I was starting to think that Maybe the bull had moved and wasn't actually bedded there still, but I knew no one else had been in the area to pressure him and push him out, and it just didn't make sense that the bull would have left that hillside where he was at during the heat of the day. So after another 15 or 20 minutes, I called again, and this time the bull did respond, but it was with that same half-hearted, lazy-sounding bugle that he'd given us earlier that morning. He was still in the exact same place just across the draw from us and slightly above us probably 250 or 300 yards away from us. Another 30 minutes or so of my sporadic calling only prompted one more reply and he was still in that same place. 
typically at that point, I would have pinpointed him and would slip up the hill and get in close to the bull and try to get him fired up. But while there was a lot of cover between us and the bull, the hillside that he was on was a north-facing hillside, and it was covered with super thick huckleberry brush, which would really make it impossible for us to slip in very close without him knowing where we were and that we were coming right for him. Our best bet was just going to be to try and get him more excited and convince him to come down to us. Burdett suggested that we split up and try calling back and forth to each other, hoping the bull would get excited when he heard these two other bulls getting worked up so close to him. That made sense to me, and at this point, I thought it's definitely worth a shot. We probably had maybe an hour or so of daylight left at that point, and the sun was completely down behind the mountain, which was giving us a good downhill thermal. Burdett slipped down the ridge that we were sitting there on, and I could hear him pushing through the brush below me as he worked across the hillside and then popped up on the open finger ridge, probably 200 yards or so to my left. The bull was still 250 or 300 yards above me, and now he was also 250 or 300 yards above Burdett. If you can envision a triangle, the bull was basically at the top point of the triangle, and Burdett and I were each on different points at the bottom of the triangle. A few minutes after Burdett made it to the ridge and things had settled back down, I let out a soft bugle and gave a couple cow calls, and then like we'd done for the last couple hours, just sat there and waited for the bull to respond. And he didn't reply, so after a few minutes, I repeated the same process, a bugle and a couple cow calls. At that point, Burdett waited for a minute or two, and then he responded to my calls with just a soft bugle of his own from over on that opposite ridge. The bull was bedded on a bench that was at the head of the draw that was now separating me from Burdett, and there were now two bulls, me and Burdett, fairly close to the real bull. As soon as Burdett answered my bugle, the bull let out a bugle. It was still the same lazy bugle he'd been giving us all day, but it was the first time that he had responded immediately. So I waited a minute or two and bugled again, and Burdett hit me right back with a more aggressive bugle this time, and again, the bull answered his bugle right away. We acted like we weren't even hearing the bull's responses, though, and Burdett and I continued calling back and forth to each other, now getting a little more fired up with each of our bugles. When the bull would respond, we'd just purposely ignore him and make him feel like we were having a conversation that he wasn't a part of. Burdett started moving up the open ridge that he was on, which ran right into the bench that the bull was bedded on. The ridge I was on angled up toward the bull, but it stopped about 80 or 100 yards below the bench that the bull was on, and it was separated from the bench by a really steep hillside that was covered with thick and super noisy dry huckleberry brush. I slowly worked my way up my ridge, still engaging with Burdett, as he slowly worked his way up the opposite ridge toward the bull. Just imagine these two legs of a triangle that Burdett and I reach on, and we're slowly moving our way up those triangle legs at the same time, intentionally getting closer to the bull, as we're also getting closer to each other. I made it as far up the ridge I was on as I could, but as soon as I stepped into that thick huckleberry brush that was separating me from the ridge that the bull was on, I knew it was going to be tough for me to get any closer. I made it probably another 15 or 20 yards, but I knew if I tried to push any closer, the bull was going to hear me and would just be sitting there waiting and watching for me as I popped out on the ridge. By this point, the bull was bugling pretty much every time Burdett and I bugled at each other, and you could tell he wasn't happy about having two bulls moving in on him and not allowing him to be part of the conversation. He got to the point where he was actually cutting us off when we would bugle. Since I couldn't move any closer to the bull, I naturally became a dedicated caller, and my job now was to just make sure I did all I could do to get Burdett a shot. The bull started making his way off the bench he had been bedded on and was coming down the ridge that Burdett was on, and I could see his antlers as he passed above the brush, probably 80 yards or so up above me. As soon as I lost sight of his antlers as he moved down the ridge, I let out a bugle, and Burdett immediately started to bugle back, and the bull cut him off. And as soon as he did, 
he turned and I could see his antlers turn and pop out above the brush up on the ridge above me as he moved back over to my side of the ridge to look down and try to see if he could see me on the hillside below him. I froze there as I could tell the bull was scanning the hillside. It was on looking for me. And then suddenly I saw his antlers swing back uh, down the ridge as he turned his head to look down towards Burdett. So I quickly let out another bugle to get his attention back over to me. And as his antlers again swung back in my direction, I heard the sound of a bow go off. And it was followed by that telltale thump of an arrow making contact with body cavity. And then the bull crashed off away from me uh, off the opposite side of the ridge. I scrambled up that steep Huckleberry hillside and saw Burdett standing there on the ridge below me probably 50 yards or so. And I hustled down the ridge to where he was standing. Before I even got to him, he started talking. And it was in an unusually loud voice, given that he had just shot an elk. And he was explaining where the bull had been standing when he shot. And as he motioned to his left in the direction the bull had ran off in, I glanced over and saw the bull laying there dead just 60 yards away, probably less than a minute after Burdett had shot. Coincidentally, that logging road that we had driven in on ended up circling around the ridge right below us and came into the draw that the bull was laying in just 80 or 100 yards down the hill from us. Of all the dead elk that I've been a part of, I've never had the luxury of sliding one into the back of a truck hole, with the exception of this seven-point bull that Burdett shot that night. In the time that it took me to hike back to the truck and drive it around to the draw, Burdett had the bull gutted and was waiting there ready for some help dragging it down the steep hillside. Even on the steep hillside, it still wasn't easy, but I had the tailgate of my truck dropped and the truck backed up flush against the hillside and we were able to slide the bull down the hill whole right into the back of my truck. And from there we drove it to camp where we hung it up still whole and skinned and quartered it. When it comes to elk hunting success, confidence is critical. And confidence in my gear and my equipment is something I'm just not willing to compromise. And that's why I shoot a Prime bow. As a mechanical engineer, when I first saw the technology Prime was designing into their bows, I was intrigued. Cam lean had always been an issue on other bows I'd shot, which made tuning the bows and ultimately getting consistent arrow flight nearly impossible. But four shots into my first prime bow, it was tuned and my arrows were flying perfectly. The draw cycle was smooth and the back wall was solid and they didn't stop there. In the years since I've started shooting a prime bow, they've added center shot technology, which allows the bow to lock on the target and keeps my pins from wandering around. They've also recently designed a new cam that completely eliminates cam lean that was previously caused by the offset cable design. Prime bows are continually leading the way when it comes to new technology and technology that makes a difference, not just some marketing gimmick that a marketing department can use to advertise a new model. There's no doubt that the stability of my prime bow has improved my accuracy, extended my range, and increased my confidence. To learn more about Prime Stability or to shoot one for yourself, visit your local bow shop or go to g5prime.com. And now, back to reaching your peak. I've experimented with a lot of different calling tactics and strategies over the years, but I'd say this was probably the first time we'd ever resorted to using geometry to kill an elk. But for the rest of that night and for several days after, as we relived that experience, we kept referring to this triangle that we had formed to call back and forth to each other to try to get the bull fired up. And it had worked. Imagine you and your hunting partner are standing right together, and there's an imaginary straight line between you and a bull that's up the hill from you. You are a point at one end of the line, and the bull is a point at the other end. Then your hunting partner moves away from you, keeping the same distance between himself and the bull. And once you're 100 or 150 yards away from each other, your hunting partner's now become a third point. And if you connect each of those three points with imaginary lines, you've formed a triangle. 
The bull is now the top point of the triangle, and the line between you and your hunting partner is the base of the triangle. The lines that then go from you to the bull and from your hunting partner to the bull are the legs of the triangle. And then as you and your hunting partner move up your respective legs, you naturally get closer to each other and closer to the bull. To the bull, it's just going to seem like you're so focused on each other that you're unintentionally moving closer to him, which is putting pressure on him to either stand his ground or to move away. But the pressure that you're putting on him is not unintentional. You're just using that second bull, that second bugle, as a distraction. And rather than moving away from the pressure like he might do if a single bull is moving his direction and focusing on vocalizing with him and communicating with him, his natural reaction is usually going to be to stand his ground and find out why these two bulls are getting so fired up. Since you aren't focusing the aggression directly on him, he really has no reason to move away. And by the time you get within 100 yards or so of him, he's annoyed that you're having this heated discussion right there in his bedroom. And to make it even worse, you're completely ignoring him. And that's often enough to get him fired up and moving in your direction, now all of a sudden ready to participate. We've employed the triangle tactic several times since that hunt and have found it effective, especially on early season bulls that are timid or not responding like this one was, or on post-rut bulls that are still vocal, but just not interested anymore in coming into calls. Just make sure the wind is in your favor and then split up 100 or 150 yards apart to form that triangle with the bull. Then just call back and forth to each other as you work your way up the legs of the triangle, increasing the intensity of your calling back and forth and slowly moving closer to each other and closer to the bull. And until next time, I'll see you guys on the next ridge or mountaintop or wherever the elk are bugling.